Merkel Media. Hey everyone, before we get into this week's show, I just want to remind you, I've been talking about it a lot, but I am moving to Tennessee this month in April, which means that if there's an issue with the show, if a show doesn't show up on time, or if the audio, if there's something wrong with the audio and it's not being fixed, that's why, because I'm out of office. I may not even have internet when I get to the new house right away, so in order to fix the things, may not be an actual option. So just bear with me, have some patience. I don't think there's going to be any issues or hiccups this month, but if there is a hiccup, that's why, because I'm moving to Tennessee. Tennessee, and I literally don't have internet to even fix it if I wanted to. So just some patience, just in case there's an issue, but I don't think there will be. Let's get to this week's show. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, Dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. But the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody else, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I'm your host, Tony Merkel. Thanks for being here. If you have a crazy, wild experience you want to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. If you want more shows on a weekly basis, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the join button and become a member because members get exclusive shows every Thursday available on the website and the Castos app. Plus, you get Tuesday shows ad-free and you get access to the overtime segments when they are available, just like today, because today is an overtime day. So if that interests you, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And also, we have preparewiththeconfessionals.com. That's preparewiththeconfessionals.com. Listen, friends, we've been talking about it a long time, and obviously, if you look at the news, there's a real reason for uh, preparing. So I'm not going to explain it to you. If you want to prepare, go to preparewiththeconfessionals.com. If you don't, I don't care. Whatever. Moving on. We got Nick coming on the show today. I'm really excited about it. Oh, by the way, before we get to Nick, I just want to say thank you to everybody who has been watching the Dogman documentary. It is available right now on YouTube. And I've been getting a lot of great reviews on that. And it's just, it's been one of those things where it's been very humbling and uh, actually almost like out of body experience kind of thing, because I can't believe I actually pulled it off and it looks like people want more of it. So I'm really excited about it. We released the documentary on YouTube nine days ago. Ago. It has over 80,000 views right now. So it's been blowing up. I'm really excited about it. And I just want to let everybody know, thank you very much for everybody who's gone and watched the documentary. It's very much appreciated. So moving on from that now, we got Nick coming on the show today. And today is a three-part interview. So we have the first part right now. Then we got the overtime right after this available to members only. And then we're going to have Nick coming back on for the third installment on Thursday for the members episode. I sat down with Nick thinking it was going to be a one hour interview and it turned out to be a lot more than that. He wasn't even expecting to share as much as he shared with me during these three interviews. But today you're going to hear Nick talk about his experiences, paranormal experiences leading up to jail. Yes, that's right. I said leading up to jail. Then he goes to jail and he talks in the overtime about going to jail, what he experienced in jail, which is absolutely astounding to me. Like I was blown away with what he was experiencing in jail and how that all turned out for him. And then he talks about for the members episode on Thursday about how when he got out of jail, him and his wife were homeless. And when they were homeless, they were invited to 
live at a church and it turns out this church was extremely haunted and it has a lot to do with the people who are running the church it was really bizarre it's absolutely the most haunted church i've ever heard of the things that were going on in that church left my jaw hitting the desk so this conversation that i had with nick progressed and it got better and better and better as it went on oh and by the way just let everybody know who's listening who aren't members and they have no plans on being members nick went to jail actually uh under uh false pretenses so there's that anyways he'll explain it all in the overtime let's get to nick in this conversation right now All right, today we got Nick on the show. Nick, what's going on, man? Hello. Good good to hear your voice. Good to hear your voice too, my friend. So, uh, listen, actually, I think what I'm going to do is before we get going on this interview, I'm just going to let the audience know that Nick has a friend in the background. So if by chance he does laugh or falls over off the chair or something, people know it's not a ghost. Just giving people a heads up. So sounds good, right? <laughs> yep. All right, cool. So, Nick, you have... Uh, a lot of experiences, man. And you and I have, uh, we're supposed to be doing this interview multiple times. And uh, we just discussed it. And what we're going to probably wind up doing, most likely, is this going to be a three uh, co- segment section. Okay. So uh, we're going to record um, a segment here and then we're going to do an overtime. And then the third one will probably be a members episode. Uh, and actually, the members episode will include Nick's friend because they kind of went through a lot of the stuff together. Uh, but today, we're going to start off in early life uh, where you grew up in a haunted house. And just to give people an idea of where we're going, uh, we're talking doppelgangers, shadow men, portals, uh, creatures, I guess, in the the house. I mean, tons of different stuff. So uh, with that said, Nick, I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, walk us into how this kind of stuff started happening in your life. Um, you know, so yeah, it was, um, uh, well, it's actually out in, in uh, the state of Oregon, first off. Um, so you know how there's a lot of stuff out, you know, happening in Oregon all the time. No, I never heard um, that before. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I grew up in uh, a little house in, uh, in Oregon and, uh, close to Mount Hood. And, um, it was a very, uh, scary house growing up. Um, and I would consider it haunted. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, my parents were, uh, kind of involved in uh, cultic practices before I was born. Um, they were, uh, involved in like, uh, kind of like what I understood to be like, kind of like Alistair Crowley type magic. Um, I'm not exactly sure exactly what that means, but that's kind of what I remember. Um, well, I mean, to me, I mean, when I hear you say Alistair Crowley stuff, I, in my mind, that's, that's, um, probably heavier stuff. I would think. It's very heavy, very heavy, uh, very dark. Um, and they, my mom is like, r- was really into it. And she um, really had a lot of really bad experiences. So that came with her into the house with, with her. And my dad was kind of just there. He didn't really experience a whole lot of experiences, but he was brought into the house. Uh, they moved into the house with all of that back, uh, back up. So, yeah, so they, uh, before they moved into the house, they became believers, they became Christians, and uh, they, that was it, you know. So they moved into the house, and I was born. And my first story uh, from there was uh, I was a little, a little kid, and I don't remember this at all, but they told me that I, my first story was uh, that I used to see a rabbit, like a dead rabbit on the ground, like a large dead rabbit. Uh, very, very large, like about four feet, five feet long. And, uh, and I used to scream when I see it and, uh, I used to just, you know, ball my eyes out and all that stuff. And, and one day my dad just walks in there, he prays over the room, grabs the rabbit, rolls it up. He doesn't see it at all, but I see it. I see what's happening. He rolls the rabbit up into like a little, like a scroll or something like that and throws it on his shoulder and walks out. And I never see it ever again from that point on. 
So that's the very first experience. Um, there was also moments where I would, uh, you know, my, my dresser in my house was pretty scary as well. I thought it was pretty scary. There was a lot of, uh, you know, screaming from the dresser, uh, the bottom drawer would slide out and the, the toy monsters in my bottom drawer would scream and yell. And I would sit there and listen to them and cry for my parents, you know, um, until they came and closed the, the dress drawer. Uh, there was also the main cupboard in the dresser and the dresser cupboard would pop open and there was voices that would come out of the, the dresser cupboard and all that. This house had a lot of problems. Um, and still to this day, my parents still live in the same house and still to this day, there's a lot of problems in the house. Um, and like you said, there was a lot of doppelgangers, a lot of portals. Um, and, uh, uh, animals, uh, ghost animals, animals coming back from the dead. Uh, and so, you know, so like the doppelgangers, I remember, um, you know, a few times I saw my, my dad, uh, walking by and then he would, you know, like, like say I was in the kitchen, whatever. And I was just looking at, you know, talking to my parents or talking to my mom, whatever. And my dad would walk by behind her and go to the bathroom. And a few minutes later, my dad would walk by again in the exact same, you know, sa same way, same fashion and go to the bathroom. And I was like, absolutely shocked by that. You know, it was like, of course, you know, you're like, whoa, that just happened twice. Um, and it happened again, you know, it happened another time with my sister, my sister, you know, I was in the living room with my mom talking with her and my sister ran by, ran it, running into her room to go play. And a little while later, she came running into the room from the direction she came from before, um, talking to us. And it was like, we just saw you going into your room. So, you know, so there was doppelganger action. Um, maybe not action is not the right word, <laughs> but I don't know. There was, <laughs> there was doppelgangers in there. Um, you know, we, we, you know, also, um, we, we never had our scissors in the house. Uh, the scissors would go missing all the time and they still go missing to this day. So we have to continually buy scissors all the time. And, um, one, one day my sister was, uh, playing with a pair of scissors on her bed. I don't, you know, it's back in the eighties. So, you know, kids can play with scissors and <laughs> she was, uh, she was playing with her scissors and they drop on the floor and they disappear through the floor in the other room. Uh, like they just in her room that, you know, she had and they just, uh, they disappeared through the floor. And so we were like, Whoa, you know, we didn't, we didn't think of anything about portals or nothing like that back then. But now looking back on it, I'm like, that was a, that was a total portal. And a month later, the scissors would show back up on her, or on the, uh, the microwave of the house months later. And that happened to, you know, earrings. It happened to, to, uh, clothes, um, whatever, you know, this, it would just disappear. And, but it was specifically that, that pair of scissors that I remember her dropping and it just disappeared right through the floor. And we got on the floor and we were looking around and seeing if we could find it. And there was nowhere around. And like a month later they appeared on the, the microwave. So and, you, you and your sister saw that. Correct. Yeah. And what would like, was this a time in your life and maybe even hers that you guys had maybe experienced so much other stuff that it didn't catch you off guard? Or did this like actually freak you out? Cause I'm, I'm trying to envision what you saw. And if I saw something like that, especially as a kid, I think I'd be freaked out for real. Uh, honestly, stuff happened every day and I got used to, um, I got used to the the paranormal. I got used to the the experiences. It was just an everyday occurrence, and so it didn't really shock me as much. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I think a, a normal person would uh, be you know a little terrified by that, but it was just just a common everyday experience over there. Um, and so they they, and they went they went through the floor, and then they were just gone for a month, and then a correct. month later they just 
up here on the you just like you walk into the kitchen and it's on top of the microwave. Correct. Yep. Wow. I, all right. Before you keep going, where do you think they were for a month? Like like the scissors. I mean, <laughs> where'd they go? Oh man, I I have no idea. I would love to think there's like some sort of alternate universe, and I I tend to think there is. There is. Um, there is <laughs> yeah yeah there is <laughs> i mean listen i say it's so factual but i i really really believe that there are parallel dimensions and there are things in those dimensions that exist they're alive whether it's spiritually or physically and uh they know we're here and so i really do believe that so when when you said that i'm like yep there is because that's what i really believe i'm tending to believe that more and more um you know <laughs> I'm just like, well, I, don't, I have no idea where they went. You know, they just disappeared. And yeah, same with the earrings. You know, they would disappear and show up later on top of the microwave. Um, so, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, that was that was the the small um, story of a, a portal in the house. Um, maybe not small, but, you know, it's and it, it happened for years and years. And uh, yeah, so portals um in the same house we had uh like shadow men there was a lot of shadows a lot of uh you know like you could see like the, just like shadows in the other room like moving and sometimes you could you know you could see like a a tall man in the other room uh just walking by and it was all shadow really really dark um and the house just the house was very oppressive overall and it was, you know, my, my parent, it was the first house that was built in the neighborhood. My parents lived in the house from the beginning. So there was really no reason, you know, like back history of the house, you know, like this person died here or whatever. It was just, it was built for them pretty much. Um, but it is on the Bartle trail. So I don't know if that, that means anything. I think your parents doing Alistair Crawley stuff means more. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Now, there's, let me ask you real mom. quick here. Uh, yeah, okay. You mentioned about Mount Hood. Uh, you is that, That's where the house was located around Mount Hood? Yeah, it's pretty close to Mount Hood. So it's okay. like kind of like toward a, like one of the gateway cities of Mount Hood. And Mount Hood is like really well known for Sasquatch, right? Correct. Okay. Yep. That's what I thought. I, I knew I. I I, th there's so many different mountains out there. I can't even keep them all. You know, I got one out here. The Appalachian mountain is just, that's it. And it's like a hill for you guys. You know, it's just like, Oh, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of walk up that little guy. Um, and so, uh, I, but Mount hood and, and we were, you and I were talking before we, um, we, we started recording here. Uh, and, and we were talking about West from Sasquatch Chronicles is, do you know if that's the mountain that he had his experience on? Cause I feel like it is, but I might be wrong. And he's my friend and I don't even know. You know, my friend over here is telling me no. So, okay. All right. St. Helens. Was it St. Helens? Yeah. St. Helens. St. Helens. Okay. Uh, I, it just was a random question that maybe would be, uh, some useful information later if it was true, but apparently it's not. I apologize. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, hey, no, you're good. It's. Mount Hood's a very beautiful mountain and it's, uh, it looms on the horizon all the time. You know, it's just everywhere you look, it's, it's there. So it's, it's massive. It's beautiful. Okay. So your hills, your mountains do look like hills compared to it. Yeah. And you're like, oh, it's so cute. Little guy. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So the, the house is, uh, yeah, the house is just, you know, it's always been haunted. It's always been creepy. Um, you know, like talking about the, uh, you know, like the animals, there was ghost animals in the house. Um, you know, like, uh, I had a cat that passed away and, um, I think it was a couple of days afterward walking through the living room, the cat's sitting on top of the couch, you know, dead. It's, it's been dead for, for a while. So, you know, it was, it was live as anything else, but sitting on the couch, but, uh, you know, you'd, I just, uh, walked by it looked at it, ignored it and walked on. I didn't want to, you know, acknowledge it at all. Um, but it was sitting there just staring at me, um, following my path through the house. And then I never saw it ever again after that. So, I mean, at this point in the house, you've had enough experiences that you're recognizing this is like a ghost cat and stuff. I mean, you're not like, 
um, thinking you're crazy or anything like that. No, I struggled with, <laughs> yeah, I struggled with thinking I was crazy for a long time, but you know, when other people experience it, it's like, okay, you know, this is pretty valid. Um, but yeah, it's, it was so normal, such an everyday thing that, that you just don't pay attention to it after a while. So yeah, that's kind of, <laughs> that's what that was. So, okay. So the animal, um, I'm trying to think of what else the house was just, uh, well, I have I have in, in my notes here about these these little creatures and uh, the hands that grab the leg. What what is that whole thing with the hallway? Yeah, so the hallway, so the hallway, uh, you know, led to the bathroom, into my mom's room, and my room was con- kind of connected off the hallway a little bit. Um, but you had to go around this corner to get to the bathroom, and the corner there was a closet right there on the in the corner of the hallway. And I hated walking by that, that corner, that closet, because the, uh, this hand would come out and grab your legs. And, you know, I never really saw the hand, but you feel the hand. You would feel the hand. It was like ice cold. It would reach out. It would grab you. And, uh, you know, it'd freak you out, of course. Um, and it happened for, you know, for a couple of decades. And after a while, you just kind of get used to it, you know, just kind of brush it off. But, um, my sister experienced it. My older brother did. My mom did. Um, we all experienced the hand and I think it's been a couple of decades since I've experienced the hand coming out of the, out of the closet. Um, but it was just, it was terrifying. Um, and in that same closet at night, you know, my, my room faced the closet, um, off of the corner of the house, you know, it, it would kind of like, my my door would face the hallway and the closet would be there. And my sister's room was right next door to my, my room. And at night we had our doors, you know, just partially open so we can get a little bit of light coming in. And, um, at night you could see these little, little guys come out of the closet and they were, uh, definitely like, they, they look like what you would call an imp. You know, they were little, black little creatures. Uh, some of them look like little pigs. Uh, they had wings on. They were really like skinny, probably about a foot tall, um, all shapes and sizes. And they would just, you know, sometimes they would just sit and stare at you and, you know, I'd be laying in bed and looking at the closet and looking at them. And it was just like really, really creepy. Um, and same with my sister. She experienced the same exact thing, um, at the same time. So, so these these creatures would come out of the closet. Correct. Yeah. And did you ever investigate to see if, how they're getting in there or No, I was probably like 6 or 6 to 8 somewhere in there. And there was no way I was going <laughs> to investigate anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right, new question. As an yeah. adult, do you ever think about how they got in there? Uh, you know I haven't until now. So there wasn't yeah. any holes or anything in the floor. No, no, there was a, I'm pretty sure they were demonic. I really don't see them as being anything, you know, like physical. They, they had a physical appearance, like a, they were manifested physical, but I, I believe they were demonic. See how I did that? I, I asked you questions to give you a layup. Uh, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> I, I had a feeling that's what you were that's what you were thinking i was just uh i was gonna let you say without me prying on it um no you can pry all you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh and and that's that's where i was kind of going with it because you know clearly i mean if this is happening often and they were physical creatures then you know they're uh, mom and dad would notice like a hole in the floor where the imps are coming through, you know, like absolutely. I, yeah. I, I, I grew up in a, tr- like a trashy trailer. Like, li- like, listen, when I like, you're talking to somebody who was trailer trash growing up, like straight up. I mean, like we, we, every definition of the term was, that was me. And, uh, I, we lived in a trailer that was just falling apart, windows falling out, doors broken off because my crazy dog jumped through it 10 times, uh, the holes in the ceiling. I, I would go up on the roof to patch it and stuff so that it wouldn't leak anymore. It was like every winter I had to do that. Um, nice. But uh, there was a time that possums came up through my floor 
because we had a big hole in it, you know, but we knew there was a hole in the floor. So, <laughs> so I, like, like, <laughs> the, you know, if the imps were physical creatures, you know, they, you would have noticed that there was at least evidence of something happening, you know, as a result of them being there. But yeah, no. the, you know, that's, we, we talked about imps. I mean, it's every once in a while we talk about imps on the show, but there was, um, I believe it was episode 50. I had uh, my actual, actually my one friend from college on the show, uh, Phil, and he's going to be coming back on again here in the future. Uh, but he talked about the imps and stuff. And back then I didn't really think about things the way I think about them now. And so I'm almost certain that when we were talking about it the whole time, I'm thinking physical creature. Whereas now I hear stories like what you just shared. And I'm like, that seems more on a, let's just call it a spiritual level than anything. Uh, Correct, you said yeah. demonic and stuff. Uh, I, I think that there, I think the spiritual realms way more complex than what we uh, uh, maybe can contemplate, you know? So um, interesting stuff. Anyways, I don't want to hijack this show. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you're good. It's yeah. I'm glad you uh, specified that. And yeah, so yes, yeah, so they were uh, definitely spiritual. I would, and I, I only say demonic because the, the fear that was, that I experienced with it, um, I had a sense of fear. So to me, that was more demonic than, you know, yeah. I, you know, than not. So, so yeah, I mean, there, there was that, you know, the little imps, you know, we talked about the doppelgangers, the portals, the, you know, my, my cat coming back from the dead for a while. Um, you know, there was a, and my sister experienced like a man pressing out of the wall in her bedroom at night, uh, looking down at her, you know, on, you know, while she was sleeping, she remembers that my brother had, uh, uh, hands come over the sides of his bed to grab him at night. Um, he actually had a name for it. I don't know if I want to say the name on, <laughs> if you don't mind saying it, I don't mind you saying it. Okay. Well, that's, that changes things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So, he, he, my brother had experiences of these hands coming through his bed and over his bed, uh, grabbing at him at night for like a long time. They were sometimes just sitting there on the edge of his bed and he gave it the name of, of Unis. And I think it was like years later, uh, that he was reading, I think the fairy queen, I think it was the classic. And inside there was, uh, this witch that, gets her hands cut off and her name was Unis, if I remember correctly. So I thought that was an interesting tie there, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's the name of the, uh, of the spirit that would visit him. Okay, let's take a second to talk about our first sponsor today, which is Cerebral. We've talked about it before. Cerebral is an online mental health service that offers prescription medication, counseling, and therapy for anxiety, depression, ADHD, insomnia, and more. Friends, this is a very good service to be involved with if you are somebody who seeks counseling, but also if you're on medications because they are one of the few services that provide prescription medications online through a licensed provider and ships medications straight to your door. So you don't got to worry about going to the pharmacy, standing in line, waiting for them to get you into the register only for them to say, oh, your prescription is not filled yet. Can you wait another 30 minutes after you waited 30 minutes in the CVS line? Yeah, we all have been there. So this actually cuts out the middleman and ships it straight to your door. It really is that simple. They also have a mobile app. So it's like having your own personal care team wherever you are. So whether you're at home or on the go, you have your care team available right there at any time you need them. And they are also very affordable as well with affordable treatments that are one third the price of traditional therapy. Treatment options are available with or without insurance. So that is a very, very good thing for so many people. And for our listeners of this program, you can receive 65% off your first month of medication management and care counseling at Cerebral.com slash Tony. Go to Cerebral.com slash Tony for 65% off your first month. That's just a total of $30 to get started. Join Cerebral today on their mission to make quality mental health care accessible and affordable for all. Did he ever tell you or anybody why he or how he came up with that name? Was it given to him or did he just name it or what? 
Uh, you know, I haven't asked. I think I think he just came up with it. I think it just you know he just knew the name of it. It's interesting. Yeah, and I, I can vouch for that. There's a couple of uh, spirits that I've experienced later on in life that I just knew the name of it. Uh, almost like they told me the name. So, so yeah, I can, I can vouch for him just knowing that. Yeah. The name of it. yeah so. And that's not a foreign concept. Obviously you guys listen to the show. It, it, you know, that, yeah. that's a, that's something that, you know, I, I don't understand how it works, but it's something that I've heard enough to understand that it does happen. <laughs> it just kind of like, it's not like something spoken to you, just kind of almost like it came to you, but it probably came to you because whatever it is, wanted it to come to you kind of thing. It's, it's kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had, we had a few, um, trinkets in the house that we found later on, you know, you know, as I was an adult, little like uh, Indian trinkets and, and, uh, there was a couple of little Buddhist statues that we got rid of out of the house. Um, we have no idea who put them in the house. Um, they were just there and the Indian trinket we burned, um, in the fireplace and like blue flames and green flames came out of it. And it was actually made of fur and the fur never really, it, the fur actually took a long time to burn. It just wouldn't burn at first. And then we had to pray and then the fur, the fur burned. Um, and it was gone from that point on, um, the little Buddhist statues, kind of the same thing. They were in the house. Nobody put, nobody, nobody's a Buddhist in the house and they were just there. And so we burned the Buddha statues as well. And, um, and they wouldn't burn at first either. So, and eventually they did. So, um, I'm trying to think of anything else about the house. Yeah. I can't think of anything else okay. about the house. So, so, uh, before we move off the house, uh, your, your parents, the history with your parents, uh, they were dabbling in occult, uh, the occult uh, before you guys were born, right? Correct. Yeah. And they, wh- at what point did they become Christians? I know you said that. Um, so probably the late seventies, I think it was. Okay. And so when yeah. when did you guys get this house? In uh, the late seventies. So right around the time that they turn away from the occult and towards Christianity is when you guys move into this house. Correct. Yeah. Were you already born? I was not born at the time. No. Were any of your siblings? Uh, My older brother. Yep. So your older brother then was uh, born and living with mom and dad while they were doing occultic things. I, I don't know about him, but I know my older sister, uh, she was alive during that time period. Okay. So you have a sister that's older than your older brother. Correct. Is she, yeah. it, but was she, was she not living in the house? Was she old enough to not live there or what? Um, I believe she lived in the house for a little while. I don't, I never really talked to her about all this stuff, to be honest. Okay. So, so, so you said that basically because you never talked to her about it, but I guess your older brother you have. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, interesting. It makes me wonder you know, I'm not an expert or anything on any of this stuff, but it just, you know, makes me feel like could there have been some kind of attachment through your parents' actions to your older brother that kept things around? And I don't know. I mean, I would have have, have you ever talked to your parents about this stuff? Yeah, I just recently did. Um and it, what's funny is that I actually had the I had a, a ton of notes written out on like three pages like three pages of notes on my parents' story. And I just moved this last week and I lost all the notes and <laughs> no way <laughs> so, yeah, right, right before the, this interview. And, uh, I lost, I lost pretty much all the notes I had, all the little sticky notes and everything that I was going to, you know, share, but, wow. um, you know what, yeah, so. like, like maybe your parents, like, would they ever want to talk to me about what life was like before their, their life in Christ? You know, I'm sure they would. I actually asked them that, and they said they would be happy to talk with you. So okay, well, I mean, maybe we can arrange that sometime because, uh, you know, I I think it would be interesting to hear it from them. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, my my mom's got some really really scary stories. So 
<laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, Alistair Crowley stuff is not the uh, the T ball league. So <laughs> no, it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, they they did play with an Ouija board, and I do know this that they back in the day they played with an Ouija board, and the Ouija board was uh, asking for their firstborn son, which is my older brother. And once it started asking that, my dad got scared of it and took it out, burned it. Actually, I think he, yeah, no, he took it out and burned it in like 12 foot flames came out of it and screaming and yelling and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, that might be a tie in right there for <laughs> yeah. my older brother. Yeah. I so. mean, so that's the thing. I mean, um, and this isn't a knock on your parents at all. And I, I hope it doesn't come across this way. And if they listen, it, I'm just saying up front, it's not. Uh, what? I, but, you know, if they were dabbling in that stuff and then they uh, they become Christians, I don't know how, how... Do you know how old your brother was when they became Christians? I don't. Okay. Yeah. So, the, so because mom and dad are Christians doesn't make your older brother a Christian. We can all agree on that, I, I'm, I'm assuming. Right. Uh, yeah, we didn't say this before, but you and your friend here are in theological school, so we can agree on this. So it's a very personal thing. And so just because mom and dad become Christians doesn't mean your older brother was a Christian at that time. Now, granted, I do believe that there is a certain age uh, that th there's a, 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 I guess, maybe a grace covering. It, it, like, listen, I, I don't think a one year old can make that kind of a decision. They don't even understand yeah. anything. Um but if 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 your older brother wasn't a Christian, let's put it this way, boil down simple terms. If he wasn't a Christian, then maybe there was an attachment that 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 got a hold of him and kind of went into this house because it couldn't hold on to your parents. I don't know. I'm just saying. Now there's a lot of people out there that that would hear that, that would say, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you can't have attachments. And I absolutely one hundred percent agree with you. Uh, and then there's other people who say that just because you're a Christian, you can't be demonically possessed. That's where I don't necessarily agree. I don't want to say I disagree. I just don't know enough, but my gut says I disagree. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm kind of, uh, I think that a Christian can be harassed really, really bad. Um, big time, big time, not, big time. Yeah. I yeah. mean, and even more so than you're supposed than to be. Correct. Yeah, it's war. It's a battle. Right. So there, there has to be more. You know, there, there must be more of a uh, a battle. So yeah, I, I agree that uh, you know Christians, can, you know, can be definitely harassed. Um, do I think they can be possessed? No, I don't, because I think they're possessed by the Holy Spirit. And, but I think they can be harassed from the outside. And I believe that's what my parents experienced. And so when they were living at the house and they experienced these things after becoming Christians, I believe that's, that explains that to me. Yeah. Um, my older brother, um, you know, he became a believer, a Christian, and he still experienced the hands, you know, as an adult a few times. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I think too. So it's just that. A Christian can be harassed pretty bad. So, yeah. And, and we've talked about this, uh, before on the show, um, over the years, we've talked about it several times, I'm sure, but, uh, you know, just a, along the lines of the, the Christian theology, forget about what all the other religions say about whatever. Um, it, it makes sense that you, you should be, um, a target once you choose sides. So, uh, you know, it, it makes sense to me. Uh, now with, with the house, uh, I think, I just think that, and I think we can all agree that there's probably a strong, um, possibility that a lot of this stuff stemmed from just actions of mom and dad before Christ. And then, uh, cause I mean, listen, that, that like, I don't think that there's a whole lot of people. I, I, I think the majority of people in this world probably never dabbled in the occult and Aleister Crowley. Right. So, yeah, not a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like when, when, when somebody like them, 
he goes a 18, does a 180 and goes the opposite direction, I imagine that there's uh, probably more things that could pop up in their personal lives because of what they came from, you know, like yeah. whether, whether you want to say it's, uh, you know, the demonic influences are, are trying desperately to get them to switch back to their team or they're just mad and they're like, okay, let's go. You know, <laughs> you know? Yeah. so yeah. that's exactly what I, what I think too. Just <laughs> so, yeah. And I think that's why my sister and I, you know, both my sisters, I'm, you know, I, I think my older sister experience, she's actually got some pretty strange experiences, but I don't really talk to her a lot about them. But I think that's why my siblings and I experienced things was because of my parents' um, dabbling into the dark arts, I guess you could say. Have you ever told your parents that? I recently did. Yeah. What'd they say? Um, <laughs> it's a, it, it, honestly, it made my mom sad. So yeah. Yeah. She, she, I think she cried about it for a while. Um, you know, when you, when you do do things in the past and it affects things in the future, it's, you know, affects yeah. the ones you loved. It's, you know, it's, it's hard. So. I, yeah, dude, totally get it. And that's why I asked because I, I imagine there was probably an emotional reaction in that sense. Even if, even if they didn't agree with you, the fact that you feel that way, uh, would probably like, dude, it's, it's, that's their kid. Do you have kids? I do, yeah. Okay, so I mean, put yourself in those shoes, right? I mean, uh, oh, yeah. like, yeah. there, like, I, I, I step sideways all the time as a parent, and I'm just new at it, like four year old and a one year old. But I say, or I'll, I'll, I'll say something to my son. Um, he'll, he'll catch me in the wrong moment and stuff, and I'll snap at him, and it, it kills me when I, when I stop and I think about what I, what I just said, and he walked away with his head down crying because I overreacted to him because I was already yeah. focused on, yeah. I was focused on an email that I just got of somebody hating on me, so I'm already mad, and it's just like, you know, it, it kills me. So I, I just can't imagine what it would feel like on, on a, such a bigger level, really, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, a, it was a recent conversation I had with him that, you know, I. We just had a, I think it was like a two or three hour sit down and we just kind of talked about what happened in the family and, and, uh, the past. So, and I will ask them if they, they want to be on the show and, uh, talk to you about some of their experiences because it's, it's been, they have some really dark, dark stuff. Um, well, I would, I would definitely be interested in that. Um, and you know, talk to them, let me know. Uh, but let's, let's move along here a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. and what I want to say here is this, uh, before we move to, uh, life got crazier after marriage. Uh, I want to say that just judging by what I see on my notes here, um, this stuff followed you throughout your life. Now, yeah. what, whether, whether it's from, the, or the origin story is mom and dad, you know, messed up and it kind of cursed the whole family uh, or or you're a Christian and you're being targeted. All the, There's so many different things you can go down as far as philosophy. It it, it really does seem like this is something that uh, it it it's far beyond the house as a kid. And um, and what we're going to cover in the third segment is. Uh, is that you did wind up getting arrested, put in jail, and there's a whole thing behind that that uh, affects you on a deep level. You said earlier to me that you have a little PTSD. If you want me to take that out, just let me know. I'll take it out. I didn't think about that before I said it. No, you're good. Okay. You're good. Uh, uh, yeah, I struggle. I struggle with talking because of the PTSD and, you know, just the stutters. So I, I think you're doing fine, man. Uh, Thank you. But um, th- these are things that, like, some of this, like, like there's so much here and, and like the jail thing is especially, it's like real life situation scenario, but it was brought on because of a, a let's just call it a spiritual attack. And, and it, it's just like, there's just a lot here. And I, I, I just, I just kind of wanted to say that before we get into this next part of your life, because uh, I, I just, I, I don't want people, uh, maybe I don't want to say either way, but I just want people to try to consume your story uh, without trying to confine it to this happened as a kid in the house. And that's why this happened. I think there's, there's a lot more to it. So go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, we, so eventually I got married. Um, my beautiful wife, we've been married for 16 years now, uh, almost 16 years. And, um, 
And when we got married, uh, she came with her own experiences. She had a long time, you know, a life of, uh, of experiences herself. And I don't think we knew this until after we got married, but, um, she, uh, she was, she's one of, I, I believe it, but it's, it's like 40 siblings. She is the only biological daughter. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, what? How is that possible? Uh, the rest of them were uh, foster kids. So they all, oh. got adopted and yeah. So she That's has cool. a lot of siblings and, um, <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. And we, uh, <laughs> that's funny everybody everybody reacts the same way they're like what that's well, crazy yeah it goes from oh my gosh this is there's got to be a crazy story here to oh that's respectable because you know if it's foster care it means that you know it, it, there's a good situation going on it wasn't like dad just couldn't stop <laughs> yeah, every, <laughs> you know what i mean that's where my mind went i was like holy crap <laughs> your poor mom no <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> so the uh yeah, so when we got when we got married, she had two little girls in the house. Um, I think there actually there might have been four four little girls, but two of them were siblings themselves, and they were on the way of getting adopted. They were both highly highly abused, and you know, thank goodness they were in my uh, mother in law's house. She provided a, a safe spot for them. And, uh, but they came with a lot of, uh, a lot of dark, you know, a lot of abuse in their, in their past. And one of the little girls and especially saw, uh, spirits quite often. And, um, and she was the younger one. The older one was kind of the same. She saw spirits, but not as much as the, the younger one. There was one specific spirit that um i would also say it's demonic uh just for the fear factor of it but uh they named um they they just knew the name of uh of peekaboo and i'm 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 having a hard time saying the name just because i'm i'm like sitting here like shaking saying the name because i've had a history with this same spirit um a little bit later on um peekaboo was a little girl and with Kind of like, I think the way they explained it was she looked like the girl from the ring, um, but she had like sharp teeth and she would play little games now. She would peek around corners and hide and, and all that stuff. Um, and so that was the, you know, some of the focus of when we got married, my wife and I, you know, we, so we had a, we had a little house to ourselves for a little while. Um, and then I lost my job and we had to move in with her mother-in-law. It's, um, you know, in the, in the city of Portland. And when we moved there, this is kind of what we experienced was the, the, these two little girls were there and they would always talk about this, this spirit named peekaboo. And at the time I used to like going outside and smoking. And when I was out, you know, smoking in the backyard, uh, late at night, I would see peekaboo walk around in the, in the garden area, the, the far you know, the, the back of the, the property just pacing back and forth, looking at me. And, um, uh, I would just kind of ignore it, you know? Um, but every once in a while, peekaboo would, uh, attack my sister and sisters in law, my, you know, my, the, sorry, uh, sisters in law and, uh, my wife. And even though I could not see peekaboo at all times, um, I was, I, I saw, you know, they, they, I could tell they were being attacked. And at this point, at one point I decided to, um, exercise one of her sisters, uh, <laughs> probably not the best thing to do, but it actually ended up being well. Um, uh, so I, her sister was just constantly attacked. And so one night, and so I just went in there into her room and she was on the bed and I, I laid down on the bed with her and I prayed and I, and I cast the, the spirit away from her. 
And as I was casting the spirit out, she heard in her ear this yelling of like, no, 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 you know, and, and she could hear the voice just trailing off like it's being dragged off. And the room got like super, super intense. Like there was just like this vibration in the room. This like the energy was so thick and I got scared because of the, the energy in the room, even though I could not hear her, hear the voice, I knew that something was going on. And my sister-in-law was just covering her ears and uh, trying not to hear the, hear peekaboo screaming. And, um, what we believe was peekaboo. And so, um, and after that, my sister-in-law has never seen the spirit ever again. Um, but the older, the older sister did once in a while. So that was, (laughs) that was hard to talk about. Sorry. That's fine. Um, breathing real hard here. (laughs) <laughs> so you catch your breath while I ask you more in-depth, detailed questions about Pikachu. Yes. All right, so uh, get your breath because I'm going to have to ask you about this. Uh, did you actually see Pikachu yourself? I only I only did when I was smoking out in the backyard. Smoking weed? No, just smoking a cigarette. Okay, I just wanted to make sure just. For not, audience, not for the audience's sake, you said you were in Oregon, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and for our last sponsor today, we got Simply Safe. Huge fan of Simply Safe. We all know that. I love Simply Safe, and so does the industry leaders. You see US News, PC Magazine, Popular Science, they all voted Simply Safe as the best home security system of 2021 and US News just named Simply Safe the best home security system of 2022 already. We're not even halfway through the year. It's amazing. Simply Safe protects your whole home around the clock, every door, window and room, and it's backed by the best 24/7 professional monitoring in the business. Ready to dispatch police, firefighters or EMTs to your home at a moment's notice. And Here's a great thing, friends. It's absolutely affordable. Simply Safe is less than a dollar a day, and you can get it set up in around 30 minutes. It's always, always simple to use. That's why they call it Simply Safe. There's never a long term contract as well. You can even try it for 60 days risk free to see if you like it. And if you don't like it, just send it back free of charge. It's that simple. And right now, you can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash confessionals. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off your interactive monitoring. Go to simplysafe.com slash confessionals. I'm going to be going to simplysafe.com slash confessionals here very soon because we're moving to Tennessee. I got to get a whole new security system for the new house. I'm actually really excited for it. It's like shopping for Christmas for me. I absolutely love doing this stuff. I like securing my home. This house is going to be having Simply Safe securing it after we leave, and the new house is going to get a new security system when we get there. SimplySafe.com slash confessionals. Go there, get your deals right now. Okay, so you're out there smoking cigarettes. You saw it in the backyard. Um, what you saw, were you by yourself in that moment? Yes, I was. What you saw, did that match the description of what others said they saw? Yes. Yes. Okay. In it that moment, like right, what did you say? It looked like a little girl in a white dress. Okay. And so, so in that moment, uh, you recognized it as peekaboo. Then you you knew what it was. Yes, and I just and you, like you know, I was t- telling about my brother with Unus. You just kind of know the name. You're like, oh, that's peekaboo. What did you think and do at that moment? Because that sounds terrifying. If if Peekaboo looks like the girl from the ring, first of all, girl from the ring freaks me out. Okay, that's <laughs> like like I don't watch scary movies because I got to do this show, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. But people ask me, did you ever see the Grudge or whatever it is? I'm like, no, because I saw the Ring when I was younger and it looks exactly the same. Not interested, you know. But now we're talking about the Ring girl with like fangs. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. Well, honestly, I, I wasn't too afraid. Um, I don't know if that's just because, uh, you know, as, I don't know. If that's just because, you know, being a Christian, you just there's nothing to worry about. Um, or it's just because I'm so used to experiencing uh, the paranormal at my, par- my, at my parents' house at that point. It was just another like, oh, OK, well, this, you know, it's, it's it is frightening, but it's not as frightening as as you think it would be. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Okay. 
totally get it. Uh, you know, like you and I probably would use very similar spiritual weapons in these kind of moments, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. But it would it would it would it would freak me out. Okay, just just being honest. So, uh, yeah, it would freak me out. Yep, that's about it. So, uh, once you did that though, and you were praying, no more issues ever again. No, not not for her. She she's never told me anything else that's ever she's ever experienced. I mean, she had some other spirits that she saw and she never saw those other spirits either. Okay. Well, it's a good, good, happy ending. Yeah, no, it was, it was good. Um, I don't know if it was the wisest thing to do, but you know, it's (laughs) just, uh, run in there and perform an exorcism. But, um, you know, it's not the, the only time I've done that. I've done that with a, you know, a few other people. Um, so, but yeah, that's that's kind of what happened there at the house. Um, and there was actually a couple times where we had to leave the house because uh, Peekaboo was bothering them so much that we had to just escape and go drive around for a little bit and then come back. Like, like, what do you mean by bothering though? Just being a pest or like something yeah. more sinister? Yeah, just just bothering them, just peeking around corners, scaring them, um, just things like that. So okay. Mm-hmm. I I just had this thought that you know what I'm not even going to say it out loud. I don't I don't want to go there. All right, carry on my friend. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I believe that's I believe that's everything that happened at that house and and I you know I'll be honest, my my timeline is all shattered um because of the PTSD. I just everything's all over the place and so I'm doing everything by places chronologically. So Okay. Um, it's really hard to keep things straight in my mind. Um, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of what happened there. Oh, they did, they did call, uh, a ghost hunter group to come out and, um, they did an an investigation for one night at their house and they actually had recordings of, of a little girl asking to play with one of the, one of my sisters-in-law and, yeah, I was, you know, saying, saying things like, can we, can I play with da da da, you know, the, the girl's name. Um, so yeah, that was, that's pretty creepy. And they yeah. caught, I guess it caught motion in the cameras and all that kind of stuff. So nice and comforting, you know, honestly, it, it, oddly it was, I know, because you, I know, because you know, you're not crazy. Yeah. That's why I said that. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, Oh, okay. There is something going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and my sister-in-law was just happy that she, they discovered something because she knew at that point that she was not crazy. Like you said. So, yeah. Um, and so from that point on, um, my wife and I, uh, we moved to another, uh, small city between Portland and, uh, Mount hood. And we moved into the, like an, a basement apartment and the, uh, as we were there, you know, th- there was a lot of other stuff. I mean, UFOs, uh, well, a UFO, um, I saw a UFO flying by, uh, overhead one night, actually not, not overhead, but, um, right down the middle of the street and, uh, kind of on side. I was, uh, we got back from the theater and we were sitting out back just talking about the movie and all of a sudden this, uh, big old UFO came flying down the street, um, on its side and you can see the street lights reflecting off of it and it was silver, not, uh, not super reflective, but um, kind of like a translucent look to it or a matte finish or whatever you call it. And it just kind of flew in, be- flew between the houses. And I got scared, you know, of course <laughs> I was like, Oh no, you know, it's, it's, you know, not my first UFO experience. My first one was as a child at my old house, actually my, the first house I talked about, it was just kind of flying by overhead. Um, nothing too you know, spectacular about that. Just seeing a disc flying overhead and uh, just a walk in my life as Nick, just (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Nothing too spectacular. Oh, that's just a UFO. It's just a UFO. I'm going to go back to doing what I was doing. You should <laughs> see what happened to me last week. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, this So this one that I saw uh, as an adult just kind of flew by um, and I got scared and my wife didn't see it, but I saw it and I grabbed her and we ran inside back into our, our basement apartment and we just kind of went to, you know, spent the rest of the night there inside and eventually fell asleep. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a hard time sleeping that night, whatever. Two weeks later, I have a, a bump on my chest, right in the center of my chest. And I keep on, um, I kept like pressing into it and kind of like, ah, it's really, it really, really hurts. You know, like it felt hard and it was, um, just really painful. And, as time went on, the the bump rose and became. I'm sorry to be graphic, but kind of pussy and you know just <laughs> you know just filled with fluid and all that stuff. And so I decided to uh, cut into my own chest. I, I pulled out a box knife and I uh, wanted to relieve some of the pressure from the um, the fluid that was built up in there. And as I was doing that, I cut into my chest. I, uh, there, there was a chip that came popping out. Uh, the chip was the size of a dime. It was square and had coils inside of it. And it looked like it was, uh, coils pressed into glass. And I pulled it out. And of course I'm like, what the heck? You know, I've, so I, <laughs> I, it, you know, scared me. And so I, I, uh, put it on the, the, uh, bathroom counter and, <clears throat> You know, there's blood all over the sink and all that stuff. I you know, put the chip on the, the you know, the, the counter. <clears throat> and I called my wife and I told her what happened. And she got scared and she wanted me to come pick her up from work. And so I got in the car, drove off, picked her up, came back, and the chip was gone. And But the blood was still there. Where'd you set the, where, where'd you put the, the chip? On the, on the kitchen, uh, on the bathroom counter, not the kitchen counter, <laughs> bathroom counter. And it was gone when I came back. And so I have no idea what happened to the chip at all. Um, I think I, w- I would love to have saved that thing. <laughs> I'm so assuming I, you would have said by now if you took a picture of it, right? Oh, I did not take a picture of it. Uh, figures. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And oh, by the way, I did send you a bunch of pictures. Yeah, I got them. Okay, cool. <clears throat> And, uh, and so, um, yeah, so that was, that was that, that was, uh, really hard to accept that because, you know, I was still thinking that, you know, for me, I'm not really sure what I think about UFOs sometimes, you know, or aliens, whatever. Um, I tend to think they're spiritual. I don't tend to think they're, uh, they're, they're as physical as they manifest themselves physical, I guess you could put it. <laughs> Interdimensional. I would say that, yeah. Um, so I don't know if the chip went into another dimension or whatever, but it just disappeared and and, uh, and that was that. So hmm. um, so I called MUFON. MUFON came out and they did an investigation and said I had a close encounter of the, the first kind. And um, because it was the, the UFO I saw was less than 500 feet away from me. Um, so yeah, so that was, that was that experience. Um, okay. Also, go ahead. You're not moving away from this yet. Are you, or are you? I could. No, I'm not. I, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. All right. So <laughs> what does your wife say about this? What does my wife say about it? Yeah, yeah. Like I'm assuming you told her you you pulled a microchip out of your out of your body and 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 you were abducted by aliens or something. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I actually have a hard time of believing I was abducted by aliens, but it's not yeah. not the first time that I've kind of experienced that. It just kind of happened the next couple of years. Do you think it's tied to the paranormal experiences that you've been describing? Do you think that I do? I okay. do. I believe. I believe everything is tied in together. I get the sense too. I get that sense too. The more I, I hear people's stories, especially uh, people like you who have complex stories and lives, you know, like it, it's, 
It's not like, hey, let me tell you about this one crazy night I had in my life. It's like, let me tell you about the many crazy nights I've had throughout my life. And no, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and I, I get the, I just over time, I get the sense that more and more that a lot of this stuff is connected. I don't think that it's always all connected, but I do get the sense like with people like you. And so uh, do you think that whatever this experience was, is maybe a, a foundational piece to the other experiences? Or do you think that this is a result of some other experiences that you've had? If that makes sense, like, like, so if, um, like, like, I know you said you have a hard time saying you were abducted. That's fine. Uh, but whatever caused a chip, a physical chip to be under your skin, whatever that was that caused that, do you think that is a foundational thing that all this other stuff launches off of? Or do you think that that whole situation is a result of something else going on in your life that, that stems all this paranormal stuff? I, I don't know if that makes sense. I'm trying to. Yeah, I, I don't think it's foundational. I do think it's uh, really, I think it's <clears throat> all kind of tied in together. I don't think the UFO experience is any different than, gotcha. than the, like the portals or the doppelgangers or the ghosts or the, I think they're all, sometimes I, I tend to think they're all one in the same. Okay. Uh, the chip, that's an awfully big chip, the size of a dime, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like that, that's, that's, that's sizable. I, I, when I think of chips in people's <laughs> bodies and stuff, I'm thinking like, you know, something that easily fits on the tip of your pinky, you know? Uh, and, and even that stuff, I mean, gets rejected because the human body tends to reject these things. Yeah. And it is yeah. obviously happening to you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Have you thought about why you had a chip on you? What it was? What was the purpose of it? I mean, it's a clearly, physical mechanical thing that was in your body that you didn't put there do you do you ever contemplate why that is i have i you know i've um i've even asked my parents you know if they have had experiences or um you know my dad he had one experience if i remember correctly um i don't remember the details of it but uh i think I tend to, I don't, I don't want to say it. I don't want to say that they're, they put it in me to keep track of me, but that's kind of what it feels like. And if it is spiritual, then, then I have no idea, <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, I don't know why that was in me. You know, I, I have contemplated it. I don't know what to think about it. Gotcha. Well, I'm not going to tell you what to think about it. Because I don't freaking know what to think about this stuff, you know. I'm just receiving, yeah. I'm just receiving the stories, entertaining conversation, and uh, letting the, letting letting the tens of thousands of people that are going to listen to your story judge you. Uh, oh, I'm not. Great. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, okay. So you, you you had a chip in your body. So what happened on Tuesday? What happened on Tuesday? I, I'm just being sarcastic. Like it's like every, it's like I, I, I was like, what happened on Tuesday, man? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> started out with a good hard boiled egg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, I don't. And the funny thing is, I don't remember missing time. I don't remember seeing any little gray guys or, or anything like that. I don't remember anything. I just remember seeing the UFO, going to bed, and two weeks later, you know, waking up with a painful chest and then you know so i still have the scar on my chest um you know so <laughs> so yeah this is a really strange experience yeah definitely um, sounds like it so you know also the same place uh the basement apartment um we had one uh spiritual experience um like a I'm not sure what to think of it, like a, either a ghost or demonic or something like that. Um, I had a, a dog with us, my wife and I, we had a dog. And at one point, the house got, the the, the apartment got so uh, intense in there. And I remember uh, the room just, you know, like there's like this uh, energy, you know, you feel before experiencing this um, or sometimes during or even afterward. But there was just like this buildup of energy. And if I remember correctly, I heard get out. And so 
I got scared. I remember running outside and talking on the phone uh, with a church mentor. And as I was talking on the phone about this whole voice and this, this feeling in the house, the dog gets booted out of the house, like literally skids across the ground because whatever was inside the house, the apartment kicked the dog out. And, and that was it there. You know, that was my last experience at that apartment. Um, and so from there, my wife and I, we moved into an apartment and we decided to go started to do, uh, Oh no, no, let me back up. That is not the only experience. Sorry. I'm, there's been so much stuff that I can't place it all in the, into the time, into a timeline. Um, at, at that time, my wife and I, we visited my parents' house and my wife, uh, had CDs from a shelf thrown at her at the old house that I was, that I first talked about and hit her all stuff. And, uh, and eventually drew blood like the, I think it threw the CDs again and it drew blood this time on my wife's chest. It bruised her so bad. And, and I got, I got kind of angry at, you know, the invisible, (laughs) you know, whatever you can't, you know, see it of course, but you know, it's like, I got mad and I was like, okay, now it's time uh, to exercise the house. It's time to exercise, uh, you know, to call an exorcist. And so I called this guy, uh, the same, uh, church mentor I was talking about and called him and asked if he would, uh, do an exorcism because that's what he used to do. Uh, he was a a missionary and he is, you know, he's also a student at the same school that my friend and I attend right now. And, you know, he learned exorcism and all, you know, they call it deliverance. One and the same thing, exorcism and deliverance. <clears throat> and so I asked him and he said he would like to meet with me. And so we met and from there started a four year uh, exorcism that I went through. Um, not particularly the house, but about, uh, but exercising me. Um, I don't believe I was possessed, but I do believe that I was harassed and it took four years to get the harassing spirits away from me. Um, so just to make a difference, you know, just to make the the point across that I don't believe I was possessed at all, but I was able to, you know, um, be harassed by these, by these spirits enough where they were controlling my life and harming my family and, uh, and doing damage to life in general. So my mentor uh, took notes. He actually has notes of the whole exorcism somewhere. I don't know where he lives at the moment. I don't uh, know what he wrote down. I know it was just page after page after page, thousands and thousands of spirits, demons. Um, and I met with him two hours a week for um, four years. Um. And it was, it was probably one of the craziest times I've had and probably one of the most uh, blessed times I had. Uh, as a Christian, I had a great time getting to know God better through that whole process of exorcism and deliverance. Um, because he, he became real for me at that point. He became the warrior. He became the aggressor and booted out what was harassing me. And so through the process of exorcism, we uh, got the names of spirits, the spirits who harassed me. A lot of them were um, ancestral. A lot of them were uh, brought about by the sins that I committed in my life. Um, For example, um, I had a spirit of pornea about me because I used to look at pornography. That's an actual spirit, pornea? Correct. Huh. Okay. And I didn't, I didn't know the name. I didn't know Greek at the time, but that's actually the name for 
that's actually an actual term. That's actually Greek uh, for like lust and pornography and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> so I struggled with pornography for a long time and that was just one of the spirits that was attached to me. Another one that we kicked off was Quetzalcoatl. Um, and, and funny enough, it was a hereditary spirit. And, and years afterward, I found out, oh, I have that, uh, I have like, you know, Aztec, uh, um, genes in me, you know? So I thought that was pretty interesting. The, uh, but Quetzalcoatl, um, I had bail attached to me. You had, you had bail B A L L or I mean, that's ball B A A L. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other, other names. Uh, Atlas was one of them. Um, and just, there was just a bunch of, a lot of them had vile names. Um, a lot of, uh, cussing, a lot of, uh, just, uh, you know, and, and every time the exorcist asked, what were they there for? They were there to destroy my life. Each one answered that. Um, now it wasn't a process. It wasn't like out loud. Sometimes, uh, the, you know, most of the time the demons or spirits would, I don't know how to explain. This is really hard to explain. Um, it wasn't verbal, but it was in like they gave me the information through my mind. If I could put that out there, um, I don't know if that makes sense. Like, yeah, like telepathically. Yeah. So, like, you know, the the mentor, the the exorcist, whatever, he would ask the spirit, and the spirit would talk to my mind. He didn't allow the the spirits or the demons to speak verbally. Um, and when they did, they were like, just gone. Um, he didn't, he didn't allow it at all. Um, but he, but he allowed them to talk to my mind and that way I can translate what they were saying to him. And I think it was more of a protection and for himself and for myself. Um, and I don't know how to explain that. That's just, that's really hard to explain. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of what happened. Um, and there was a lot of visuals I had, um, a lot of out of body experiences at that point. Um, you know, I, I saw like this, this spirit at one point that came out of me that looked like a big black cloth flying through the air. Um, and it just kind of shot out of the room and, and, you know, down the street. Um, the walls were banging, uh, nothing, nothing like Hollywood. It was definitely not Hollywood, not like the exorcist or anything like that. It was actually very, uh, very quiet for the most part. Um, and during the whole process, I, you know, I listened to, to, to worship music, um, Keith Green to be exact, you know, just good, good music. Um, and so there was just, you know, so the whole process was, there was like a hierarchy, and you, you had to cut out the hierarchy. And once you cut out the hierarchy, then you conquer that whole mountain, whatever, of, of spirits. And you just knock them out and they're done. Um, and during that process of exorcism, uh, we got close to being done. And we could tell we're done because there was not a lot coming forward. And it was just getting quiet and there's a lot of peace and a lot of, um, like solitude that I had, I don't know how to explain it. Just, just a lot of peace. And I could hear the Holy spirit in me speaking clearer than ever before. And it was more like a, like a, like a four year confession of all the things I've, I've done. And it was just nice to get it all off my chest. And during that process, you know, I felt really bad about my older, you know, sister-in-law who still kept seeing peekaboo. And so I decided to, from my mentor's house, exercise my sister-in-law at her place. And because 
of, uh, of like authority issues. Um, I was able to, to do that. Um, I don't know how to explain that. Like the authority of like the spiritual authority of the house. And so I was able to exercise her from a distance. And when I did, uh, we, I wanted to get rid of peekaboo from her life. And so I started praying, we started praying to, you know, uh, to exercise peekaboo from my older sister in law's life and the spirit peekaboo came zipping up right out of nowhere and like got right in my face and, and was just beyond, beyond angry at me. And, uh, and I did see her then. Um, and we exercised her and we got rid of her and my older and my, the older sister-in-law never saw her ever again after that. So there you go. That's the, <laughs> that's the, uh, the exorcism experience. Man. Um, four years of that. So that was, uh, very tiring. I remember that, but very, very good. It sounds draining. Uh, I'm also sitting here thinking about the uh, consistency, the persistence and consistency that it would take to do that for four years. Did you ever come across a period of time where you just was like, I don't want to do this again. I'm just, I'm just done. Yeah. Yeah. There was moments, but you know, I think it's like work when you don't want to go to work, you keep working, you know, your feet just push you along and your body pushes you along and you just keep doing what you need to do. Um, so that's kind of how I, treated it even though i i myself might not want to do it i just my body pushed me to do it hmm. so i showed up every week and and plus i just i really liked my mentor i thought he was a really good dude and it was such a a spiritual blessing to to be there it was almost like a like a worship service i don't know how to explain that like because you're there to meet god in the process of deliverance yeah that makes sense yeah uh all right so we're at this point now and is is this the point where we we cross into the jail time we could yeah yep okay so uh what we'll do is i want you to share uh the this experience of you know how I guess, I guess how you wound up in jail for seven months, and uh, and then on the next segment we'll get into life uh, after jail with your wife when you guys moved into that small church. Okay, yeah, I can definitely do that. And as I was in jail, I had a lot of experiences too. We'll cover that on the the the, uh, the next segment. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so what landed me? What landed me in jail? Uh, my wife and I decided to do foster care and we moved into an apartment and we decided to do foster care and we had, I think a total of, I think it was nine kids in one year, uh, under the age of three. And not that that matters, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, but we, we took care of foster kids and at one point, uh, I had a dream, I think it was about a year into foster care that I had a dream. And in the dream, this demon showed up and it was, it had, uh, if it came to my, you know, came right before me and it started poking my chest and it started, you know, beating my chest and poking it and, and, and with like really sharp claws. And it was saying, I got you, I got you. And, and I was like, what the heck is, you know, what do you mean? You know, and I, and I woke up and I had, you know, poke marks on my chest that were bleeding. Um, you know, it drew blood in my, you know, my, in my sleep and I got worried. And, uh, and so I, uh, yeah, I, so the next, the next morning I got, a phone call from a lawyer saying that the police were coming out to arrest me. And, uh, and I, and I said, you know, I was kind of, 
you know, I was like, what the, you know, what, what is going on? You know? And so, um, I get arrested and for uh, a crime I've never committed or I don't know how to explain that. Like, uh, yeah, I just got arrested for, uh, I'm struggling through this, man. This is hard. <laughs> I, I understand. Are, are, are you debating in your mind whether you want to say what you got arrested for? Because, yeah. okay. Yeah. Cause, Cause you, people, you know, I understand if you don't want to say, you don't have to say, um, you. but you know, I, 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 at least for me on my end, man, you're the, like, you're not going to talk to the audience they're, they're, you know I mean? For me on my end and stuff, uh, I, I'll just tell you, man, like, I mean, I've never been to jail and stuff, but I have, I, I can't tell you how many friends who I've had that have gone to jail because they actually did the crime. Uh, yeah. I've, I've have countless of friends that I've had to pick up and put in rehabs. Like you're, you're talking to a guy who's not gonna be like, Oh, cheapers. I'm talking to somebody who got put in jail. You know, like that's <laughs> like, I, I've, I've dealt with jail in my life, my entire adult life with, through friends and stuff. So, um, yeah. but it's up to you, man. I, I don't care. Well, I'll just, I'll just say I got arrested. So yeah, that's just, fine. So, so yeah, I, uh, so I got arrested and I got placed in jail and I was in there for a good seven months in solitary confinement. And I'm not exactly sure. I think it was, I think it was maybe about a month or two while I was in there that I found out what I was arrested for. Really? Yeah, it was, I was arrested for like, uh, like under terrorist, uh, under the terrorist laws or something like that. Um, so they couldn't tell me what I was arrested for. Um, and Thanks, I had no Bush. Thanks a lot, President Bush. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bush. Um, <laughs> and so that's not what it was for, but that's kind of what they arrested me as under. And so I was in there and um, yeah, it just, that's for me when life changed. Um, I had some really, really good experiences while I was in there. Um, spiritual experiences, not bad ones, but really good ones that kind of outweighed the, the bad in my previous life, <laughs> you know, what happened previously. Yeah. So, um, and that's it. Perfect. So, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think that's a spot where we'll leave off here and we'll cover up in the cover, start off in the next segment where, uh, we'll cover your experiences in jail and then we'll move into life after jail. Uh, I have a feeling that that the next sec- segment is probably going to um, be a little on the longer side. So uh, I'm just I, I think we got a lot of stuff to cover. And so anybody who's a member, uh, they can just tune into the overtime segment right now and it's available for you sitting there waiting for you. Uh, Nick, listen, man, I appreciate you making the time to, to share this first hour, hour, almost hour and a half and uh, buckle up. We got more coming, man. All right. Thank you very much. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. I don't care where or how you share the show. Just share the show if you enjoyed it, because that's the best thing you can do to help the show grow. Just share the show. We greatly appreciate it. And just a reminder, we have Nick here for the overtime section available right now for members only, where he talks about getting put in jail and the crazy things he experienced in jail with other inmates. Absolutely bizarre stuff. And then on Thursday, when he gets out of jail, that's where we pick up on Thursday. Him and his wife are pretty much homeless. They're invited to live at a church. And it turns out this church was extremely haunted. And I think personally, it has a lot to do with the people who are actually running the church. Bizarre people, very bizarre situation. And that's on Thursday with Nick for the third installment. Listen, friends, I greatly appreciate you being here. Thank you very much for listening on a weekly basis. And as we get out of here, you'll be able to listen to the beginning. We're back for round two with my man, Nick. Nick, how you doing, man? Doing good. Awesome, man. So listen, uh, we are recording here and I'm looking at my recording actually, and it's not doing what I thought it would do, but it's okay. It's still working. Anyway, sorry. I got distracted there. Squirrel. Uh, I, uh, I, um, 
we did, we did the initial recording and now we're going to be doing this one where it's we're transitioning into uh you know basically what you experienced within the the prison system but you know let I mean if you're okay with it we if you if you can share how this whole thing unfolded how you got there and stuff because you said that uh you didn't do what you were accused of and if I remember correctly I don't have my notes in front of me I believe you said you spent 7 years in prison No I spent 7 months in uh-huh. uh in jail Okay. Um, yeah, protective custody. Okay, gotcha. In, in protective custody. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, listen, if you are okay with share, just share whatever you're okay with. Let's just put it that way, okay? Because I, I don't want to put you in a position where you feel obligated to say certain things. I know you struggle with PTSD from this whole experience. So if you could just um, share what you can as far as like the process of what happened to get you there. If you if if it's just you know, hey, something happened. I didn't do it. I was in jail. Let's start from there. That's fine. Just uh, walk us into, you know, this whole situation unfolding for you, man. All right. So I'm going to rehash a little bit um, what was uh, said the last time. And we went over uh, my exorcism. I believe I was incarcerated uh, because of the results of the exorcism. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, I can't really prove that, but it just kind of kind of went that way. Um so one night I had a, uh, after the exorcism, I had a dream and in the dream, I was, uh, faced with a demon This demon came to me and he started poking my chest or it started poking my chest. I keep wanting to say he, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it came and poked my chest and it was telling me, I got you. I got you. It was like, like the, the air of getting back at me, like it was revenge. And, uh, it was poking my chest so hard that I, I woke up with actual blood on my chest. Um, and so the, the physical, you know, it, it manifested physically on my body, like the dream did. And, uh, and that day I got a, I got a phone call saying I was uh, going to be arrested and they were going to send out SWAT and all that kind of stuff, helicopters. I was going to be on the news and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, no way, I'm not going to, I don't want to be uh, on the news. I don't want to be, you know, I don't know what's going on, but I'm just going to turn myself in and figure this from that point on. Uh, so I, I went to the, the nearest uh, jailhouse or the nearest um, police station. And I, I turned myself in and I actually had no idea what I was arrested for until about three months after the arrest. Wow. Um, they wouldn't tell me it was, I was arrested under some sort of uh, terrorist law. Um, I don't know what, what it was. I never really looked into it, but uh, it was the, uh,